Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you and so my lab and my personal research interest is in understanding how the interactions between plants and their microbiomes especially fungi but also bacteria how they scale across different levels of biological organization. So like they their interactions how they impact each other but also how they might scale up to impact populations, communities, and ecosystem functions. We are interested, for instance, how the endophytes in the leaves of plants that can produce alkaloids might impact like the nectar microbiome. This is because we know in some literature that chemicals that the plant can produce for defense Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Michelle Afkemi. Uh, she's an associate professor at University of Miami in the Department of Biology. And uh, we're going to talk about mycorrhizal fungi and soil and what's called the phylosphere microbiomes, you now plants and, uh, and the surrounding ecosystems function. So, Michelle, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you. Oh, great. Tell me a bit about your background and what got you interested in, in I guess, for lack of a better word, mushrooms or fungi. Yeah, sure. So, in general, I think... A lot of people realize that humans have diverse microbiomes that play important roles in human health and even impact like our physiology, the way we think, our pathology, and so and so on. I think far fewer people probably realize that plants also host a complex microbiome that's composed of fungi and of course also bacteria that play crucial roles in, you know, like plant health, productivity, survival, and so on. And so my lab and my personal research interest is in understanding how the interactions between plants and their microbiomes, especially fungi, but also bacteria, how they scale across different levels of biological organization. So like they, their interactions, how they impact each other, but also how they might scale up to impact populations, communities, and ecosystem functions. And then also we all are also interested in scaling down and asking about the genomic and molecular basis of these interactions. And so, okay. yeah. From what I've heard, you know, when uh, near a plant's root system, there's like tons of stuff going on. You have the, you know, the plant and the root nodules and bacteria take up residence there and form their own microenvironment. And then you have mycorrhizae, or, you know, that extend their hyphae into that region and they form their own structures. And so I guess near a plant root, there's, there's just tons of stuff going on, tons of different kingdoms and, and everything all interacting. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about a plant, the root system area is, you know, chock full of microbes, but also there's a lot of microbes in, as you mentioned, the phylosphere, which is the above ground part of the plant. And they actually have diverse microbes living inside them, like fungal endophytes, as well as the, you know, phylosphere, you know, like the, the actual epiphytic microbes. So there's on the leaves and stuff like that as well. And in the nectar of the plant. So just yeah, plants host a really complex associations with microbes. Yeah, I, I've you know I've spoken to some people that speak about again the um, the microbiome of the plant essentially below ground, but above ground, you're the first. I mean, it makes total sense <laughs> that there would be all these disparate microbiomes. Like we have a skin one. Yeah, I guess supposedly different creatures live in our eyelashes and eyebrows. So where is it? do you have a focus, or are you looking at just all the different microbial communities that surround plants? 
and like yeah. there's a yeah, good question. So our lab is pretty diverse. We do study all the different microbial communities that associate with plants because, you know, they really like the the microbiome and all these different components are impacting a lot of the ecological and evolutionary questions we're interested in. Of course, a lot of the applied goals um, for pressing societal needs like conservation and restoration and agriculture. So we're quite interested in in all the different components of the microbiome and and the microbes in the soil that interact with the you know that are providing the pool of microbes that the plant interacts with. So, what are some of the commonalities you see amongst the different colonies, and then maybe some of the differences after that? Yeah, so I think one thing that is really of interest to me is the beneficial microbes. So, you know, you mentioned mycorrhizal fungi. I mentioned fungal endophytes, and those are in different components of the plant. So the fungal, well, fungal endophytes actually can reside in any part of the plant. There are some that are only occur in the above ground tissue. So there's these, these ones that grow throughout the leaves and, and stems and can actually even grow into the seeds and be transmitted from parent to offspring. And those fungal endophytes, for instance, can increase drought tolerance of the plants as can mycorrhizal fungi. They do it in different ways. The mycorrhizal fungi it basically create uh, this big hyphal network in the soil and so they can access pools of water that and nutrients that might not be as easily accessible to the plant root system versus the the ones in the above ground tissue actually change the physiology of the plants in ways that could increase the drought tolerance or nutrient uptake. There's definitely um, some benefits that both pools of, of microbes can confer to the plants. They're, they do it, as I said, in different, somewhat different ways. In terms of, you know, jobs, metabolic function, defense, et cetera. What's, what's the division between, um, you know, the microbiome of plants and the plants themselves? Like what, you know, what's being traded or, you know, in the human body, you may have short chain fatty acids, sugar molecules, things like that. What about in the plants? You know, what's being traded above and below ground? Has anyone looked? Yeah. So people have a pretty good idea. So uh, when you think about organisms that associate with plants and trade resources, or even when you talk outside of microbes, but certainly with the these fungal microbes and bacterial microbes, a lot of what they're getting is photosynthetic carbon. So they're getting the sugars. Sometimes they also get shelter, so they get like somewhere to live. And, and they can be, of course, many other things too. But those are some of the most common ones for, for, the, for the microbes to receive. In, the, in terms of what the plant might get, it can be a lot of different things. So it can bring, so like nitrogen fixing bacteria, for example, okay, we're going bacteria, but that's a clear one where they fit, fix atmospheric nitrogen and trade it to the plant. But also mycorrhizal fungi, they can increase water, nutrient uptake, like especially phosphorus is traded. And then they, there's some benefits that are like maybe more surprising, like the fungal endophytes I was talking about can actually produce alkaloids as part of their metabolism that deter herbivores that want to eat them. So whether they be insects or even mammals. So there's a lot of different benefits they can they can provide. So is it uh does it make sense to say that you know all areas of a plant have equal activity or they're you know near the root bundle is there a lot more going on than above ground on the plant? Are there a lot more <laughs> microbes, more diversity, more interactions or not necessarily yeah, that's a good question too. So, I mean, I guess there's the, there's what's inside the plant and what's outside the plant. So the endophytic compartment, the part of the plant that, you know, the, the part of the microbiome that's inside the plant is, is typically less diverse than, because it takes, you know, special, well, it, it can be more difficult to get inside of, of a host organism compared to living on the surface of it. So that's one thing we see. And then when you were talking about below ground versus above ground, looking at, you know, like our studies and some other studies in the literature, it does seem like we get higher diversities of microbiomes in the root zone than we do on the, in, especially in the endophytic compartment of the above ground part of the plant. So the leaf, the inside the leaves, we do see many microbes, but not necessarily the diversity that I see in, in the like area mm. right around the roots. Before we continue... I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, 
including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. It seems like plants are like people and they're they're stuck in the ground upside down and their head and all the, I guess that maybe the highest level functions seem to occur around the root bundle, but I don't know if that's a, that's a valid comparison. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I threw up my mind around that a little more, but it, it definitely, you know, I think there's a lot of comparisons to be made between humans and plants in terms of, you know, the, a lot of the functionalities, like traits that we attribute to, to humans and to plants are often actually turn out to be microbial traits. So in the case of, you know, a plant, like we can say how, you know, like where we think it can occur based on susceptibility to drought, but actually that's not only being impacted by the traits of the plant, but also by the traits of the, the microbe and the microbial interaction. And so I think that's, you know, something we see it too with, you know, sort of human and, and, and how in human functions as well. You know, based, because plant cells have a cell wall, I, I don't know if it, I don't know what materials can transit the cell walls or if it is as easily as let's say, you know, human cells or bacteria, but um, I don't know, you know, do plants produce, I would guess they produce their own exosomes from the cells that come out, interact with other organisms. And, you know, there's a passage of uh, materials in and out of cells individually, or are plants forced to kind of do it in a different way because of the physiology of their cells and their cell walls? Well, I think there's a couple of things I can say with respect to this. So, so some of the fung- fungi, you know, some things are intercellular and some things are intracellular. So not all of, so some fungi actually are, you know, cross the cell boundary, but many are living, like even those fungal endophytes I was talking about earlier are, are actually living between the cells. And so only products are being passed back and forth. The other thing is, is that a lot of how plants communicate with the microbiome is through, um, even through like exudates. So the roots exudates can be, the plant produces can actually prime the microbial community and, and change the, you know, the composition and, and diversity near the root system compared to the surrounding habitat. And so there's a lot of, you know, sort of complexity in these interactions, but um, there's still, I think, a lot that to be learned about how, you know, the resources are transmitted back and forth. Yeah, do plants have like a very robust epigenetic system like people do or their own version of it? To be honest, that's not something that I personally study. I just so assume because you study plants, you know everything there is to know about. Every <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's fine. I guess I'm not sure about the answer to how important epigenetics is in plants relative to humans. It's just not something that. My no problem. I was I was teasing. I know you can. There's no <laughs> way to answer everything. Um. So what what are the questions you're trying to answer with your research? What are you focused in on? Yeah. So we're really interested in quite a range of questions in ecology and evolution. As I said, we're trying to have to get a a mechanistic understanding of how these interactions play out at population, community, and ecosystem levels. And so, when I say mechanistic, sometimes that means like understanding the the population dynamics to understand why species occur across the distribution. But sometimes it also means looking at the genes or gene expression. And so, an example of um, some of the work that we've been doing that has an impact on applied goals. We've been thinking a lot about things like habitat fragmentation. So habitat fragmentation is the breaking up of natural landscapes, which occurs when it's human driven. It basically you're getting non-native habitat that's highly human impacted that's breaking up the natural landscape. And so you so what happens is that you're introducing a, a non you know, new conditions into the landscape, which, of course, has big impacts on the or- how organisms experience it. But then also you're that we're spreading out the natural habitat. So it's becoming less connected. And so that also impacts how organisms experience it. For instance, when we think about plants and animals, movement from one native habitat patch to the next may be hampered by having, you know, a, a conditions that are much more difficult in between. So for instance, in our case, we're often thinking about urban environments and how those urban habitats, uh, you know, might be have 
a lot more concrete. So it's impermeable for, so plants can't really grow in it, but also they have trouble, the seeds have trouble dispersing to the other native habitat patches. And so there's been a lot of interest in understanding habitat fragmentations impacts on plants and animals and, and macroorganisms in general, but we have much less understanding about how they impact microorganisms, which is concerning given that we know that that fungi and bacteria have big implications for ecosystem functions like decomposition and, uh, you know, and, and primary production and so on. When I say primary production, I mean through its interactions with plants. Um, and so essentially what we've been finding in the lab when we started studying habitat fragmentation in an imperiled uh, habitat in South Florida known as the Pine Rocklands is that <laughs> the habitat fragmentation impacts the microbiome in a lot of ways. It impacts the diversity of the communities. It impacts the makeup of those communities in terms of composition. And it even impacts the functional profiles of those communities. And in turn, when we do experiments with um, these microbiomes that have experienced fragmentation, we see that it it can have um, pretty important consequences for the plant performance in terms of its growth and can even disrupt the um, these interactions leading to changes in the productivity of native plant communities. And so one of the takeaways we've had from that is that when we you know, are trying to do restoration or conservation, we need to be considering the microbiomes in these landscapes, um, which I think is quite important. We've also been very interested in understanding the use of these interact, well, how these complex interactions play out through interactions among the microbes and how that impacts the host and whether that could be important for sustainable agriculture. So for instance, we have uh, done studies on what we call multiple mutualist effects, where you have not just one beneficial microbe, but multiple well-known beneficial microbes. So like nitrogen fixing bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi to see whether we can get synergistic effects on the productivity of the plants so that, and the whether, if, and it, actually identifying the genetic variation in the host that allows for these synergistic responses with the goal of potentially in the future breeding for crops that are best able to utilize these natural species interactions to increase productivity without the high human health and environmental health costs of, you know, some of the traditional agricultural practices like a lot of fertilization or irrigation. Okay, so, I mean, are you studying, you know, broken up habitats and what happens to the plants that are remaining in them or separated or like, what are you studying? Sure. So in the case of habitat fragmentation work, we actually characterize the microbiomes from the different habitat patches that are remaining. So the Pine Rocklands occurs on the Miami Rock Ridge, and there's been disproportionate human habitation on there. So like a lot of homes have been built on the, the rock ridge because if you get storm surge during a hurricane, they flood, they flood, they're not as likely to flood. And so a lot of that habitat has been destroyed, but a lot of what's left, about 2% of its historic distribution are remaining. And so what we've done is actually go to these different sites that have now mostly protected and characterize the microbiome to, to figure out if how fragmentation has been impacting them. And then, as well as other factors. Oh, right. What have you found? Do the communities yeah, so, tend to start to diverge? Yeah. So what we found is that there is impacts on the diversity, um, the composition, and the functional profiles of the microbiome. So, for instance, we've seen that you get higher diversity when you have lower human impacts. So, for instance, more connected, less fragmented uh, landscape and less... Um, and less fire suppression, because when you get urbanization, a lot of times, of course, people don't want their, you know, they don't want the possibility of their home burning. So there's um, often reduced fire, even if that's a natural part of the ecosystem. And so that's the kind of thing we've been finding is that these changes are, ha are actually reducing the diversity and changing the, the functions that are present. So that's some of the outcomes. If I'm, you know, if I'm sitting right near the root bundle on a plant, you know, you have the plant cells themselves. Then you have bacteria, I guess, that are, you know, extremely local to the roots. Then you have the hyphae of the mycorrhizal fungi that extend from close to, I don't know how far out. You know, as you go further and further away from a root, like what, what is the chain of 
of trading look like? What is what does the chain of organisms look like as you go, I guess, further and further away from a root bundle? And what are their roles? Like, I don't know if you can describe, you know, as best you can, the structure of what goes on near a plant root, for instance. That's a good question. So near a root system, the 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 plant can um, have a you know can have a bigger influence, a sphere of influence, I guess you might say. So because I think I mentioned this earlier, the idea of root exudates. So the plant actually will put what's known as exudates out into the soil, and that will change the composition of the community. So one thing you can see is that, you know, like it can know, do what we call priming, which could potentially increase some of the beneficial microbes that it wants to attract. However, at the same time, you know, pathogens may build up underneath a plant, you know, because essentially like over time, they can see it as a resource that can be utilized. As you get further away from the root systems of plants, you know, the the plant probably has less impact on the composition and makeup of the microbiome. It's still a big question in terms of like what abiotic factors influence the microbial community. So like the, you know, outside, once you get outside of the plant, you know, range of influence. So a lot of work has shown things like pH are quite important. In our work, we've seen that, in fact, other factors can be quite important depending on the ecosystem. So things like fire could be very important. Another thing that can matter in some types of ecosystems are other plant influences like allelopathy. So if the plant, allelopathy is essentially chemical, is a chemical warfare that plants use with each other, but it also can impact the microbiome. So essentially it can have favor some microbes or over others. And we've found that in our own work. What are, um, I mean, what do you think are some of these implications? It sounds like it's, uh, you know, the plant microbiomes incredibly complex. Are you studying any of the interaction between like disparate microbiomes on a plant? I've always been curious, for instance, um, let's say there's a microbiome on the top of a leaf and a different one on the bottom of a leaf. What does it look like at the interface? You know, like what goes on there? I don't know if anyone studied those kinds of things. Or as you transition from one to another, what does the, the edges look like that meet? Yeah, that's a really interesting question as well. We haven't, I don't think I have any data currently on that. We are interested, for instance, how the endophytes in the leaves of plants that can produce alkaloids might impact like the nectar microbiome. This is because we know in, in some literature that chemicals that the plant can produce for defense against insect herbivores, for instance, can actually end up in the nectar, which can have non-target effects on pollinators. So essentially, right, you don't, you want to attract those pollinators, not make them ill. And so this is not an optimal thing, but something that happens sometimes in plants when you have a lot of chemical defense. We were, we've been quite curious about how, um, the chemicals produced, the chemical defense produced by endophytes might impact the nectar microbiome, but we don't have any data on that at this point. I do think there's quite a big literature on how above and below ground communities of microbes impact one another. So for instance, we've found that these fungal endophytes in the leaves do have an impact on mycorrhizal colonization and can also impact benefits that they get from the mycorrhizal fungi. So I do think that there's quite a bit of indications that they influence each other in terms of how much they associate with the plant and how that association works out. But I think there's there's quite a bit more interesting questions in there that could be addressed in the future. Yeah. What are some of the, like, the really interesting ones that you want to work on, whether you can or not now? Like, what, what fascinates you about this? So are you talking specifically with respect to the interactions among different microbiome communities or just in general? Uh, both. I, mean, I don't know if you, if you have an example of that, great. Just personally, you know, or as a scientist, what, what, sure. like, what are the burning questions that you want to answer? What fascinates you about this? Yeah. So what I really want to know right now is more about the advent of high throughput sequencing has really revolutionized how we study fungi and bacteria because it allows scientists to catalog the diversity, the makeup of communities of microbes from all over the world, whether we're talking natural, agricultural, human engineered environments. Um, so we increasingly have a good idea of who's where. And, and there's also been a lot of work by a ton of different scientists, including myself, interested in 
how microbe, you know, demonstrating that microbes have important consequences for their host organisms. And so what I'm really excited about right now is trying to understand how they're doing it across, you know, a number of levels of biological organization. But the thing that I think will be really useful is trying to do some functional profiling at, in a high throughput way. And so some of the approaches that I think we have uh, seen, you know, that is, uh, we're really interested in our lab, but also I think we've seen um, become, are becoming more and more interesting to people in general is utilizing things like metagenomics and metatranscriptomic approaches because it allows scientists to evaluate the functional potential of communities by sequencing the microbial genes present or evaluating which of these functions are actually being expressed under different environmental conditions. And so, you know, I feel like using these tools from other subdisciplines like genomics and uh, molecular biology in conjunction with ecological and evolutionary approaches opens a lot of new avenues for understanding how those effects are taking place. Hmm. Okay. Um, is anyone studying, I guess, or again, do you think it's even important to look at, again, what happens at the edge of a given microbial community as it bleeds into another? Does it bleed? Is there a, you know, a dividing line? Is there maybe like a temporary biofilm set up at the edge of a community to kind of keep it all together and another biofilm sits outside of that? Is anyone looking at that kind of thing? Yeah, I think that there are people who are interested in trying to understand the makeup of the microbiome at a fine scale with, within the host. And I also think that there's um, interest in that when we think about the environmental microbiome. So, for instance, one of the systems we work in is at Archibald Biological Station, it, where the Florida scrub is. And in that ecosystem, there's a biological soil crust, which is a community that includes like cyanobacteria that, you know, that have a lot of nutrient, that have a lot of roles in nutrient acquisition. And so you get this like physical layer that like you can actually pick up off the soil on the top of the soil. And you get, so you get a really different community there than you do in the deeper subterranean soils. And so you can see that there's like, there's, you know, may, there's definitely members of that community that are spanning both of those uh, habitat types in terms of depth and also different habitat types across the landscape. But at the same time, we're, we're, we see clear differentiation. And some of it has to do with, you know, like in the case of the soil crust, that functional relationship of creating that physical structure. So I think there's, there is a quite a bit of interest around that. Mm, and when okay. you and I was going to say, when you break that, um, this is some work that was done a, a while ago, but people have shown that if you break that soil, that soil crust, it impacts the ability um, of the plant, of seeds, uh, native plant species, including some endangered species to actually germinate, um, you know, well in those soils. So they, they can have quite a important cascading effect. Yeah. I think they call them soil crusts. And even yep. in deserts, they have them like these, mm -hmm. it's like crispy, crunchy, you know, uh, area where microbes gather and make uh, I don't know what it is maybe they have their own I don't know it seems like they I don't know maybe they in sand obviously it would be crunchy but I don't know in soil it, it also does seem to be crunchy and crispy I wonder how they um maybe they're sticking together parts of the soil to make it crispy I don't know it's just interesting the texture of them I felt them before as they crumble yeah it's pretty neat to like yes to see that like them actually the physical structure of it and in the this, the Florida scrub is actually very sandy soils, so it, very similar to the desert, except for like the the sort of uh, climatic conditions are different. But yeah, it's got a similar soil type. Do you know if um, anyone's trying to mod uh, model the the dynamics of what goes or, you know what goes on with the microbiome? I, I would guess the root would probably be by far the most complex, but uh, you know on leaves or on stems or in nectar. Um, is anyone mod looking for biofilms and looking at the structure of the bacteria, or is that really not? I mean, there's a million things you could look at, and that's really not uh, on the radar. Just thinking about that. So I do think people are interested in, I mean, I think this kind of gets back to maybe what I was, tr I got, I was trying to say before, which is understanding how these microbial communities actually work. So, you know, I was talking about how they confer functions to, you know, like how they confer benefits through understanding function. But I think a lot of people are interested in trying to de-black box the microbiome to understand how they actually work. So your, I think your example is a good one. Something that like 
I'm been really interested in is trying to understand microbiome stability. So essentially because the world has lots of disturbances and they're only getting more common in the Anthropocene with increasing stress, it's going to be really important to understand how how microbiomes respond to these disturbances and forms of stress. And so that's something we've actually been studying. And our results so far suggest that, unfortunately, with that stressors can dramatically destabilize microbiomes, which I think could be problematic given the fact that the microbiomes can be quite important for the is it sort of ecosystem functions and their interactions with other players in the community. Yeah. I was also thinking when you mentioned nectar, and I was also thinking of fruit, you know, it's an area of the plant where there's tons of sugar. And, um, you know, like in the nectar, for instance, is the plant producing all the sugar and then the bacteria that take up residence there, are they just sugar lovers? And what are they converting it into? Is there anything useful or interesting that, you know, any compounds that result from the bacteria working on, again, this mass amount of sugars? So, yeah, I mean, I haven't actually, that's a good point. I have not studied the microbiome in the fruit, so I can't say too much about their, what they're doing in there, but obviously, you know, they're, they're obviously are having, you know, an impact because we know like fermentation, for instance, is a microbial process, but I don't, I guess I don't know the details of how that, that microbiome works. Yeah, they have pretty specialized things. It'd be interesting to talk to somebody about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It'd be very interesting. Well, you mentioned that metagenomics is used to look at the functionality. So of the various communities that you've looked at of, you know, microbes, what has metagenomics told you that's interesting about the function of the bacteria, you know, wherever it may be, root, leaf, stem, nectar? Yeah. So right now we've mostly been utilizing actually metatranscriptomics um, because we're really interested in which functions are actually being expressed. And, um, you know, because we're interested in um, how the microbiome is responding to different treatments. And so one example that we're working on right now is um, we did an experiment where we wanted to understand how fire in a naturally pyrogenic ecosystem impacted the microbiome with, and then its interactions with plants. And so we did a big experiment where we looked at the effect of, of microbiomes that experienced, well, the first thing we did was look at micro, the, the microbiomes that had different legacies fire experience. So they had fire, some of them had had an experienced fire in like a hundred years, and some of these patches had experienced fire within a year of, of the experiment. So we had like 35 different fire histories, and then we took those soils and had them, we put placed them in a, the field and exposed them to what's known as a prescribed burn. And so we were looking at this sort of pulse fire effect and its interaction with the long-term fire history of the microbiome. And then also tested those microbial communities on plant performance. And so what we've been working right now on a metatranscriptomic project to look at how those microbial communities have responded in terms of their transcriptomes. And so unfortunately, we haven't quite finished analyzing those data. We're, we're right about to, to get there. So. I can't really say the answer at this point. Um, we know on the plant side of it that the plant community, their microbiomes were most strongly, uh, the microbiome effect on the plant in terms of the microbiome mediated effect on, on the plant of fire was most impacted by pulse, the pulse short-term fire. And we know that the community composition of the microbiome strongly responded to fire, but we're still in process figuring out the, the metatranscriptomic changes in the in the microbiome i guess they seem to do well after a fire are there are other microbes that people have found that uh love to eat i guess all the charred material that a fire leaves behind um yeah so there are some um groups that are particularly resilient um to to fire and um, a lot of them can be quite important for influencing the uh, the plant response so the thing is is like one thing we were really surprised by was how quickly the microbiome reassembled after fire this is you know in this particular ecosystem so i know of cases where people have found that it took a really um long time after a wildfire for the microbial community to um, recover 
in our case, we were looking at a, natu a naturally pyrogenic ecosystem that was that has a lot of spatial structure where fire burns sort of a patchwork way. And because of that, the the we were really surprised that the microbial community seemed to, you know, recover quite a bit in even just like a year. Um, so a lot of the the microbes, there there were some differences in terms of which ones made it back first, but it was much faster overall than we expected. Hmm, interesting. Well, very good. Um, you know, sorry I asked you so many questions you didn't know the answer to, but there's, I guess, a ton to know. It's not possible for any one person to know even a tenth of it. So, um, sure. What's the, what's the best way for people to find out more about the research that you're doing? Where can yeah, so if they want to find out more about the kind of work that we do, um, certainly I have, you know, my website. If they're more just interested in, in generally on the topic, um, actually, there's um, a lot of resources that are, are listed actually on my website You can that link to um, some of the other labs that study this kind of um, work. And so that would be one way to, to get involved, involved with it. Okay. Well, very good. Michelle, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I, I appreciate your speculation on some of the questions that have no answer. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Have a good day. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.